without passion, nothing happens in life. But without compassion, uh, the wrong things happen. Well, I am Jan Liesson. Uh, I'm a Swedish diplomat. Uh, I was foreign minister of Sweden, but I was mostly in my career, in the last part of my career, at the United Nations. I was mediating in the Iran-Iraq war. Um, I was later mediating in the war uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and later in Darfur and in the different Sudan uh, crisis, humanitarian crisis. And I came up with four reasons to uh, uh, fail or succeed. One is the use of the word. Two is the timing of your proposal. Three is the cultural sensitivity that you show. And four is the personal relations or your personality. I'm a Swede, born in the port city of Gothenburg, Göteborg, uh, into a working class family. I was the first one to uh, get a chance to study for more than seven years. And uh, I lived a very happy young life, but uh, under very simple circumstances. My parents uh, exposed me to unspoken expectations. They uh, had never had the chance themselves to study. And uh, they followed me and my brother extremely closely uh, and encouraged us. Never put pressure on us, but we felt that we must uh, deliver. We must show that when we now get the education, we should use it well. My father was a metal worker. He was a very principled man. After the, uh, the camps, the concentration camps were opened, in 1945 by the Americans, British and others who came in. Uh, there was a Swedish magazine that specialized in pictures. And when I was five years old, he put me on his lap and then he uh, showed me these horrifying pictures uh, with the dead or dying and people in striped pajama-like clothes, whatever remained of clothes for them. Uh, and uh, my mom was saying, what are you doing, John? You can't do that. He will, this will, these pictures will stay with him for life. He's only five. And my father said, that's exactly what I want to do. And these pictures are still with me. And when I have worked as I've done in humanitarian crisis, me having been in Myanmar with the Rohingyas and having been in different refugee camps in uh, different parts of the world, seen the, seen the horrifying conditions of war and, uh, and persecution, uh, th these pictures come back, not in a way like a nightmare, but as a reminder of uh, what values my dad wanted me to have with me in my life. It was pretty brutal, but damn it, it was effective. My work uh, up until age 40 approximately was, uh, I would say, a classical diplomatic career. Uh, but uh, Palmer felt that my interventions and advice brought something new to the kind of work that he wanted to have on foreign policy. So uh, when he was asked uh, in 1980 to be the UN, mediator in the war between Iran and Iraq. He called me personally and asked me to go with him in the shuttle diplomacy that was going to be being conducted between Baghdad and Tehran. He called me at 7 o'clock in the morning and uh, asked me to, to do this. And uh, I said, uh, listen, it's a pretty big deal. I have two kids and my wife needs to know and and then he said um, fine I understand my wife would probably have asked the same question but can you do it quickly uh, yes of course because you are booked on the flight to New York tomorrow 
We are meeting the Secretary General in the late afternoon and the Security Council the following day. And then that changed my life. From that moment on, I was involved in uh, conflict resolution, mediation. Normally in conflicts, people are extremely suspicious and even fearful, fearful of their political future, even their physical life. So when they feel that you are honest uh, and you tell the truth and that you are correct in conveying the messages, then you have a much greater chance. Once, for instance, I came to uh, Tehran from Baghdad, I had more or less forced the Iraqis to accept that they should, in the end, at a peace agreement, return to the international recognized boundary, which was a big diplomatic gain. At that time, 700,000 people had been killed. Uh, there was no gain of uh, territory on any side. But the Iranian was, Iranians were so suspicious. They hated Saddam Hussein and they didn't, they didn't trust him. So they kept going and, and trying to make me doubt that this commitment was lasting. In the end, I got so tired. It was 35 degrees in the room. It was 40 degrees outside. I was sleepy after not having slept for a long time. So I, I, I failed in my language because I said, let's break up. Because I felt that I was almost falling asleep in front of the foreign minister of Iran. And then that translated into Farsi, Persian. Became something like, it's over. Finito, I'm going to the airport, this is over, I'm not going to do anything with you anymore. And then he asked me rhetorically, oh, you don't want to negotiate. And what is it you want to do when you're in Tehran? If you don't, you don't want to stay with us. <laughs> I leaned back and my colleagues thought it was about uh, five minutes, but it was probably 20 seconds. And then I said, well, after all, I've been here now 20 times during the shuttle diplomacy. And as of yet, I have not yet been to the carpet museum, which is supposed to be the best in the world. And I got completely confused. But in the end, they ordered a car, drove me to the museum. I spent three hours with these three guys. And in the car back, they were more or less climbing on me, explaining more, and became enormously enthusiastic about my interest, which was genuine in these carpets, the colors and shapes and, and knots and so forth. And when I came back to the foreign ministry and the ministry, the minister saw us coming in, they said, the three my companions to the museum, pointed to me, this is our friend. He is our friend. And I realized that I had pushed the button of cultural sensitivity. That I, by saying that, yes, I'm tired, I don't want to negotiate, but I want to go see what your parents, grandparents, all you people in those villages did. Another example of uh, what diplomacy can do if you show flexibility and imagination. I have many examples of words who or which save lives. And the story that I have is that I was called to Sudan during the civil war between the south and the north of the government in Khartoum. Uh, in the uh, early 90s. It was 1993, the war was raging. I went there in order to try to get the local ceasefire. I came to uh, President Bashir, who stayed for as, in the leadership for many years. Uh, and he, of course, refused because he considered a ceasefire as something that would give legitimacy acceptance to the what he called the rebels or terrorists even. He had a point. So I asked them to have a sort of a free discussion of words. Think of something else to negotiate. Oh really, but you have been asked to do ceasefire, local ceasefire. Doesn't work. Well, a tranquility of a zone of tranquility. Um, good, you're on the right track. Something more concrete. And then we landed in the word humanitarian corridor, which was then introduced. And we then set up a 180 kilometer, a planned uh, 180 long, uh, kilometer long corridor, 60 kilometers wide. We would save all villages, whether they were government controlled or 
controlled by the uh, rebels, as he called them. And they didn't have, and this was my idea, they didn't have to make an agreement between themselves. They could only make, the, it was enough to make a commitment to the UN, which organized this humanitarian corridor. And five days later, the planes, helicopters and small planes flew, food and medicine and everything needed to this area. And what was it that saved lives? It was the word. When I talked about, when I talk about Sudan, I have another example. One time I was asked uh, alone to go to see the leaders of one of the biggest tribes in Darfur, the so-called Fur tribe. I took a helicopter to the Fur area, the Jebel Mara, the sort of desert and with some oasis, but also mountains, very harsh landscape. I landed the hel we landed the helicopter and I went down to a little grove and under the acacia trees, there I met the leaders of the Fur tribe. Men in around their 80s, white robes, white turbans. I presented my delegation and then I started asking about the history of the Fur tribe. And they kept talking for an hour. And I listened very attentively about the fantastic story about the Fur tribe, which was a very powerful entity, almost like a kingdom. And they spoke about their culture and their economy and their traditions. And I was more and more interested. In, and then after an hour or two, they more or less said to me that they would accept my offer and my, my proposal. And I hadn't even proposed it. And I realized this was because they saw that I was showing respect to their culture and history and traditions. And they had thought about it, of course, before I came. So they said, we will tell our young militants that they should stop fighting and you tell us, tell us when and we will then come to the delegation, come to the negotiation. We'll see whether we will accept the, or the results. We can't tell you, but we will start, which was a great diplomatic victory. So I thanked them profusely and then I walked up to the helicopter, which was on a sand dune close to the, uh, these uh, acacia trees. And then I waved to the leaders. They were standing there with their village people around them, about 60, 70 people. And then they started to move in my direction. And I wonder what's going on. It turned out that they had between them, behind them, young people carrying a live goat. I realized quickly that this was a gift to me. At my side was the pilot of the helicopter, a very nice but very strict Ukrainian who said, Sir, no goats on any helicopter. Don't you ever think that you can take that live goat on board our helicopter? I said, do you realize that if I refuse this goat, it's over. I can't humiliate the leaders of the fool to refuse their gift with their village people following behind them. So he said, okay, sir, uh, we'll take the goat on board. We'll tie up the legs, both back and forth. But then I'll tell you what, we don't have safety belts for goats. I was sitting on the helicopter with my feet on the goat. But it shows sort of, to me, what cultural sensitivity can mean. It would have been the end of my negotiations if I had refused that gift. Uh, in mediation, you need to think of three preconditions. One is that you, as a mediator, know the subject extremely well. You must know it in detail. You must not, or you should not, in fact, show how much you know, because when the parties try to put traps, negotiation traps, in front of you, you can then avoid them and know, and they notice that you know. Second uh, precondition is that there must be enough political will among the parties to come to an agreement. Sometimes people go to negotiations, but they don't really want a solution. The third precondition is that there is no outside force 
that wants to sabotage the conflict or the, the negotiation. But then what you also will experience is, is the enormous joy of family reunification uh, or uh, thousands of refugees crossing uh, a border after an agreement or a prisoner of war exchange with families reuniting. And then, by the way, most important of all, the silence of guns. The silence of guns and the fact that you know that children can go to school and that people can live normal lives. And I think we should uh, keep that in mind all the time. The horrors of war and the beauty of peace. <laughs>